Prisoner's plan. The storm is coming, I can tell. The water leaking in has become stronger. There's no better time than now. When the storm hits the guards, we'll be scrambling to figure out what to do with us. Amidst the confusion, we need to overpower the few that will be standing guard while outside our cells and hold off the cell block entrance. We need only hold off until I can get one of their swords and break open the drainage grate in the corner of my cell. That's where we will make our escape. Everyone move down the river and we'll try to find shelter there until the storm passes. Hello. I'm going to read a book. Rislav the Righteous. By Sinjin. Like all true heroes, Rislav Larich had inauspicious beginnings. We are told by chroniclers that the springtide night in the 448th year of the first era on which he was born was unseasonably cold and that his mother, Queen Lenata, died very shortly after setting eyes upon her son. If he were much beloved of his father, King Morris of Skingrad, who already had plenty of hires, three sons and four daughters before him. Chroniclers make no mention of it. His existence was so very undistinguished that we hear virtually nothing of him for the first twenty years of his life. His schooling, we can suppose, was similar to that of any spare prince in the Colovian West, with alien tutors to teach him the ways of hunting and battle. Etiquette, religious instruction, and even the basic statecraft were seldom a part of a training of a prince of highlands as it was in more civilized valley of Nebene. There's a brief reference to him together with his family as part of the roles of honor during the coronation of the Emperor Gorius on the 23rd of Sun's Dawn, 1st Era 461. The ceremony, of course, held during the time of the Alessian doctrines of Merak, and so was without entertainment. But the 13-year-old Rislav was still witness to some of the greatest figures of legend, the Beast of Anakina, Darlok, Bray, represented his kingdom, giving honor to the empire. The chieftain of Skyrim, Korik, the White, and his son Hag were in attendance. 
and despite the Empire's intolerance of all elves, Chimmer and Doro, Nevar, and Dwemer Dumai, Dwarf King, were evidently there as well, diplomatically representing Resdane, all in realms of peace. Also mentioned on the rolls was a young Myrrh in service to the Imperial Court of High Rock, who was to have a great history with Rislav, Rain Dereni. Whether the two young men of about the same age met and conversed is entirely the stuff of historians' fancy. Rain is spoken of in praising words as a powerful landowner, eventually buying the island of Balfira in the Leak Bay gradually conquering all of High Rock and large parts of Hammerfell and Skyrim. But Rislav is not heard of again in history's books for another 17 years. We can only offer supposition, supposition based on the facts that follow. Children of kings are, of course, married to the children of other kings to blind alliances. The kingdoms of Skingrad and Kvatch skirmished over common territory throughout the 5th century until they reached a peace in the year 472. The details of this accord are not recorded, but since we know that Prince Rislav was in the court of Kvatch six years later as husband to Belin, the daughter of King Justinus, it is fair to make an educated guess that they were married then to make peace. This brings us to the year 478, when a great plague swept through all of Cyrodiil and seemed particularly concentrated in the independent Colovian West. Among the victims were King Morris and the rest of the entire royal family in Skingrad. Rislav's only surviving elder brother, Dorald, survived, being in Imperial City as a priest of Marka, Morak. He returned to his homeland to assume the throne of Dorald. We have some history. The king's second son. He was slightly simple-minded and evidently very pious, pious. All the chroniclers spoke of his sweetness and decency. How he saw a vision in his early years that brought him with his father's blessing from Skingrad to the imperial city and the priesthood. Priesthood of Marak, of course, saw the no difference between spiritual and political matters. It was the religion of the Alessian Empire, and it taught that to resist the emperor was to resist the gods. Given that, it is scarcely a surprise what Doro did when he became king of the independent kingdom of Skingrad. He first edict on his very first day was to cede the kingdom to the empire. The reaction throughout Colovian estates was shock and outrage, nowhere more so than in the court of Kvatch. Rislav Larik, we are told, rode forth to his brother's kingdom, together with his wife and two dozen of his father-in-law's cavalry. It was surely not an impressive army, no matter how the chroniclers embellish it, but they had little trouble defeating all the guards Dorod sent to stop them. In truth, there was no actual battling, for the soldiers of Skingrad resented their new king's decision to give up their autonomy. The brothers faced one, an one another in the castle courtyard where they had grown up. In typical Colovian fashion, there was no trial, no accusations of treason, no jury, no judge, only an executioner. Thou art no brother of mine, Rislav Larch said, and struck Dorald's head from his shoulders in one blow. He was crowned king of Skingrad, still holding the same bloody axe in his arms. If King Rislav had no battle experience beforehand, that was shortly to change. Word spread quickly to the imperial city. Skingrad, once offered, was now being taken back. Gorius was an accomplished warrior, even before taking the throne. And the 17 years he had as emperor were scarcely peaceful. Only eight months before Dorald's assassination and Rislav's ascendancy,
Gorius and the Lessian army had forced another of his coronation guests, Coric the White, on the fields of the frozen north. The high chieftain of Skyrim lost his life in the Battle of Sungard, while the pact of chieftains was selecting a new leader. Cyrodiil was busily grabbing back the land of southern Skyrim that it had lost. In short, Emperor Gorius knew how to deal with rebellious vassals. The Alessian army poured westward like a flood of death to borrow the chronicler's phrase in numbers far exceeding what would be required to conquer Skingran. Gorius could not have thought actual battle was likely. Rislav, as we said, had little to no experience at warfare, and only a few days practice at Kingcraft. His kingdom and all of Clovian West had just been ravaged by plague. The Alessians anticipated that a mere show of arms and a surrender. Grislav instead prepared for battle. He quickly inspected his troops and drew up plans. The chroniclers who had heretofore Heretofore ignored the life of Rislav, and now devote verse after verse describing the king's aspect with fetishistic delight. While it may lack literary merit and taste, we are at least given some details at last. Not surprisingly, the king wore the finest armor of his era. It's a Clovian estate then had the finest leathersmiths, the only type of armor available in all of Tamriel. The king's Calabanian mail, boiled and waxed for hardness and studded with inch-long spikes, was a rich chestnut bread, and he wore it over his back tunic, but under his black cloak. The statue of Rislav the Righteous, which now stands in Skingrad, is a romanticized version of king, but not inaccurate, except in the armor represented. No bard of the Clovian West would have gone to the market so lightly protected, but it does, as we all see, 